Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome, welcome to Freedom Speaks with Michael Roll. Um, I'm very grateful for your presence in this moment. Thank you for all joining me for this very special edition, I guess, of this podcast. It's our second podcast for um, a very special guest, uh, Scott Tackleman, which I'll, I'll introduce you to those of you who are coming on to it for the first time. I'll give you a reintroduction to Scott. But Scott today is going to do Darshan, I guess, with us. Um, take us through some information first, which is mind-blowing when I first thought. And then he will give us a little bit of a dash on um, with one of his musician friends, and they're going to just blow our minds away like last week. What I wanted to share just before we start with was an aspect of freedom that I've been working with within myself, or rather an aspect of enslavement where I felt enslaved within myself. And that is around the theme of being humiliated. When I first started this podcast, it was coming out of a cave, so to speak. And what it brought up for me was a fear that I felt resonating in my body of being humiliated, of being shamed. Now, as an energetic healer, if you think of all the different areas of our body which we feel our emotions in, well, if we're feeling guilt, it generally it shuts down our crown chakra and we get disconnected from source. If we're feeling doubt, or doubt is, is in, our, in our physiology, it shuts down our third eye. Well, what shuts down the throat chakra is shame. And so when we have a, a fear of speaking our truth and really putting ourselves out there, that feeling came up for me of being humiliated, of not being able to be free within myself to speak my truth, for free, I guess, of people not liking me or not wanting to be with me or not wanting to listen to the podcast. All of those little insecurities of the smallest self within myself started to arise. Now that comes back, uh, you know, the, the fear of humiliation, you can trace back, I guess, to being ostracized from the tribe. When we were in very much tribal society, we could be ostracized. And that was the worst. That was like a death. When you got ostracized from the tribe, you were literally dying a death because you had no support. You felt that you'd lost your identity because everyone took their identity from the tribe. And I guess that also fell into what the church used to do was the worst punishment the church could do was the only power the church really had in those days was excommunication. Essentially, we were linked to God through the church or we thought we were linked to God through the church and then we were excommunicated, that was a death sentence. So I wanted to talk a little bit about anxiety today. Um, this nature of anxiety and why we are not really free until we've looked at our anxiety, which covers a whole range of things. And I won't go into in depth detail because I really want you to have as much time as you can with, with Scott and with Laura. But the nature of anxiety is one of the areas where we have worries, concerns, and all our problems, continually thinking and worrying about the future, either activating the past, reactivating the past or what occurred in the past, resisting the present, or trying to plan for the future. So I want to read a little extract from a, a beautiful little book. Um, it's by a, an incredible uh, healer by the name of Saint Germain, and it's called The Studies of Alchemy, Formulas for Self-Transformation. -trans this is what Saint Germain says about anxiety. Anxiety is the great warp of life. It warps perspective without producing any perceptible benefit whatsoever. Isn't that interesting? When I feel this sense of anxiety within myself or this sense of fear of being humiliated, there is just a feeling that's flowing through me. Obviously at some level I'm buying into that feeling within myself. And that's then affecting, and I can feel the physiological aspect of that. The body starts to tremble. Maybe the body gets a little nervous. My stomach starts to feel a little bit of anxiety that sits within that. But there's no benefit to actually buying into that. And that's the key little area that we buy into those anxieties rather than allowing ourselves to witness that and let it flow through. St. Germain goes on to say, anxiety is the cause of people's tendency to hoard the goods of this life. Like frantic squirrels, they pile up their winter supply of nuts. They accumulate an oversupply of every imaginable item and they deprive themselves of happiness by their unwarranted concerns and their unnecessary and time-consuming preparation for every eventuality. 
I wonder how much of my life I've spent worrying. <laughs> how much of our life I've actually spent in that state of anxiety that's kept me from the present moment. What a waste. It just seems like a monumental waste of time, of, of energy, of non-productive. There's no fruit. Anxiety doesn't bring us any fruit. Neither does worry bring us any fruit, yet we buy into that. And I guess that's what we should really talk about at some point, is how do we deal with our anxiety from a very, very practical perspective? And at this time at the end, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about that. I want to bring up just one more aspect of anxiety, which St. Germain talks about in this, this beautiful book. Anxiety stems from the lack of faith in the ultimate purpose of life. The hard experiences that have come to many in childhood in later years, creating stresses and strains and producing the fruit of bitterness have prevented their development of that refined spirit which will enable them to shed their anxiety. I guess what he's saying here is almost Freudian in some way or psych psychological. That's the bitterness within us is why we hold on to our anxieties. The stress that, that, that bitterness causes in our hearts because we have a difficult experience and all of us have had those tremendous difficult experiences the long dark night of the soul to some degree. And the bitterness that comes from this and then anxiety of i don't want that experience to repeat that's kind of the way in which we actually keep our anxiety from not flowing through us is because we don't want to feel anxiety no one likes to feel anxiety to feel that nervousness or that palpitation perhaps or that worry about being humiliated i love what he says anxiety stems from a lack of faith if you think of faith, and this is not religious faith in terms of faith in some sort of uh, external deity, it's more about the faith within to ourselves. Now, if you think of the word unfaithful, when we say a partner is being unfaithful, well, what that really means is the partner has done something to, to uh, displace our trust in them. Well, true faith really is the faith within ourselves. It is that surrender to our own presence within us. And that is where we are, are unfaithful. We are unfaithful to ourselves at a much deeper level. And how can we ever move past our anxiety if we're not in touch with our true self? Because essentially, everyone has faith in something. What do we have faith in? What do you have faith in? I wanted to show you the back of a, of a $20 bill. Uh, for those of you on the podcast, you can see the $20 bill. But if you look at the back of a $20 bill, it says, in God we trust. Isn't that amazing? So we say that it's in our, in our currency that we use constantly in God we trust. And, and I'm referring to God, I'm not referring to that external deity. I'm talking about the, the true presence of self within us. And I guess when I'm in, when I'm feeling anxious, what I and I'm, if I'm buying into that anxiety, I'm not in the trust of my true self. There's a misplaced identity for one, but I'm not in that true self, in my real trusting in myself. So consider in your life where have you placed your trust? Where what are you faithful to? Is it some sort of faith in your lower self or your personality to provide? Simply put, we know we're in. When we're in stress, struggle with life, we're out of alignment to our true self. So, happy days. A little bit about anxiety, and thank you for allowing me to share that. Um, I think at this point, it would be so wonderful for you to feel the transcendence of two beautiful human beings. Um, I want to introduce you to Scott Heckelman, for those of you who haven't met him before. Scott is a just, we had another meeting this week or just another chat this week over some coffee. Oh, what an incredible um, stories he tells and experiences he's had in his life. Scott is a master craftsman. He builds musical instruments. But that musical instrument is actually is building music for transcendence, for self-realization. He's a philosopher. From a very early age, he had these incredible awakening experiences. And when you speak to him, he brings up little more experiences. For example, he has sat with Maharishi, 
and was like extremely jealous when he told me that. And then I got even more jealous when he told me he had actually sat with uh, Ramna Krishna, wow, which was uh, incredible. I mean, just to be able to, to, to sit with those. And then he has, he's got a great story to tell us about Yogananda, but I'll leave it up to him if he wants to share that story with you because I just, you know, in general, I think, what was I doing in my life? When I was playing football, I should have been, <laughs> I wish I was in India. <laughs> but I guess playing football has made me what I am today. So happy days. So Scott, um, over to you. So we are deeply grateful to have your presence with us. Thank you for being on this podcast. <clears throat> Absolutely, Michael. Thank you. So, um, it's interesting um, that you brought up the subject of uh, of uh, shame and and uh, and of course the anxiety that comes from that because and and this in a way it's 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 a little difficult to to create a segue from that into Pythagoras right <laughs> yes apologies but, I said you have <laughs> Interesting thing is when you think about it, when you think of what, what the Pythagoreans were doing, I mean, he, he wasn't just some philosopher sitting around spout, you know, getting into arguments with people or whatever. No, he started a school, you know, he, he had a, he had retreats, he had, it was considered a cult at the time, um, but he started a school and a whole way of thought and a whole uh, attitude and, and, and um, uh, a posture, if you will, toward society. Okay. And it's these, it's this, it's this pressure of society, of so-called society, that um, that creates this bond of control, this, this control that we give it, basically, and and it and it shows itself extremely powerfully with shame, and um, so the kind of work that Pythagoras did, okay was for one thing, like I said, to, to, to establish a, a, uh, a different kind of relationship with society, right? Uh, these different feelings of shame, et cetera, they're, they're a part of human nature, but it depends on, on how, how we abdicate our own, how we position, how, what our attitude toward these feelings are and how they're interpreted. If we allow society to completely take the reins of those horses, then then we we lose our own sovereignty and we also lose the connection to this a larger view of things which is i in my opinion one of the major contributions of the pythagoreans and the pythagorean school um so that being said as far as the segue to pythagoras there's one other little little observation i figure out. i'm going to just kind of throw in to the to the ring uh, uh, dealing with the subject of shame all right um i feel that shame is part of a two-sided coin uh, this coin is the judgment of society upon us and because of because we trade in this coin we acquiesce to the to the value that society puts on us rather than establishing a relationship of ourselves with our higher selves. So shame is on one side of that coin. On the other side of that coin is pride. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of times we, that's even a bigger trap than shame because you're constantly, oh, I'm so proud of what you did, or I feel really proud of my accomplishments, et cetera, et cetera. And we see that as a good thing. And I contend that it is not a good thing, that it's the other side of this coin of societal judgment. Yeah. It's, so, it's a primary duality, absolutely, between yeah. those two. What so, collapses, uh -huh. sorry, just to tell you, what collapses pride and shame is gratitude when you can find the gratitude for a physiological trait that you have, maybe you're good at playing music. When you find gratitude for that, it destroys the pride because you can just be, thank you for allowing me to do this. You know that you're not your body or this great musician, you're something much deeper than that, but you can find the gratitude for something that you're really amazing at. There you go. That's a really good point, Michael. And um, so um, as far as the, the subject of the Pythagoreans and so forth, what in our last 
um, get together last week, right? Um, I was sharing with, with you the this aspect of music and the transcendent aspect of music, and part of the theme there was how, as far as the freedom, the in interpretation in terms of freedom, is the the bonding the bounding aspect of the ego and how when the ego enters into things it can stand as an obstacle to true freedom and um, and the and the paradox of how music much music most music is very ego bound and um, so I wanted to share my discoveries uh, over the years of, of a kind of music which is not ego bound which um, is not based on your virtuosity um, or great skills or years and years of training, um, but rather it cultivates a certain way of listening and, uh, and, and also cultivates a certain kind of music which is created. And so in, in the process of doing that, I shared with you the tambura, right? Um, so in the course of talking about the tambura, I mentioned that there's another way also of understanding music, and that's in this broader context. And this broader context is part of where I'm coming from as far as my interpretation and understanding of what Pythagoras was speaking about. And, and this is also speaking to an aspect of freedom, right? Which has to do with, with um, uh, 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 an expansion of consciousness, an expansion of knowledge and awareness, and um, and and what this has to do is is, is with compartmentalization. Um, as long as everything is compartmentalized, right? Oh, that is uh, that's a solid, that's a liquid, that's a gas, right? Or um, this is music, and this is sound over here, um, and this is light over here. Um, as long as we are never aware of this actual broader reality and how actually everything, everything is connected, right? When we become aware of this connectedness and interconnectedness, right? That it fosters and encourages this condition of freedom and expansion of consciousness. So with that in mind, I thought what, 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 it, what I'd do is share with you some slides that I made uh, that explain this connection between uh, sound and light. And um, uh, one little and 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 and, we, and I won't get too heavy into the math. I, you know, there's some formulas there, and it explains the math, the principles behind it, and the math, and all of that stuff. We don't have to get too heavy into all of that stuff, but it, it's it's nice to know, and it's nice to kind of see it there and have some references, right? And then. Um, uh, once that's kind of established, then I figured it'd be nice to just kind of like we did last time, maybe, but this time maybe a little bit longer, play some music. Now, in this case, we have the tempura, and my, my friend Laura, who's been studying tempura and studying uh, the uh, meditation, the music meditation and so forth, and is even building a tempura for herself, um, she'll play the tambura that we, the same one we had last time, but and then I'll be playing the the hand pan, right? And uh, and you'll see in the in the slide presentation, um, I know Laura's going to be all over this. Uh, you'll see in the slide presentation, um, uh, my ex my explanation of the actual tuning on this hand pan. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and click on the on the um, uh, screen share and um, and get into the slides uh, all right can you hear me okay and oops where'd it go get back here yep we can hear you fine Scott and it's okay great yeah it's sharing now just Wonderful. And you can see the slide okay, huh? Perfect, yeah. Good. All right, so you may be familiar with this. This is um, a very famous fresco in the Vatican um, of the, the School of Athens. And um, um, it's depicting all the famous philosophers, well, up to that time at least, all the famous philosophers. 
And um, in the middle, of course, is Aristotle and Plato, and they're involved in a deep discussion. And every philosopher, every, every single one of them, the way they're posed, the way they're holding their hands, where they're looking, it's all, everything is symbolic of, of the different aspects of their philosophy. And it's always kind of fun, actually, to go through this, this uh, painting and try to figure out who's who, you know. And, um, I mean, the, the sloppy-looking cat down in the foreground, that's Diogenes, because he didn't really like, he, he was kind of rough, pretty rough. Anyway, down in the lower left-hand corner where I have it circled, that's Pythagoras. And Pythagoras is busy writing notes and keeping track of things, but he has a student uh, holding a chalkboard, basically, in front of him. And there's something very significant on, on that chalkboard. And, and what that is, uh, is a reiteration of the importance and the significance of music in his philosophical school. He felt that music was a, was a, a means by which to, to understand, not only understand, but also connect with the grander universe. And the, what's on that chalkboard is a graphic um, uh, from the Pythagorean traditions of Pythagoras' basic musical intervals um, that are based on harmonics. Now, in today, when we look at a piano keyboard and all this kind of things, it, all of the tunings that we use today are not, <clears throat> are not based on this system. They're, 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 they reference this, they kind of come from this tradition, but they're not tuned this way. We use equal temperament today. This is something that's based on the harmonics of the music. And what that means is that harmonics is the way that everything vibrates. Everything vibrates. If you, if you bump your head on a low-hanging door, you're going to set up harmonics in that door <laughs> or harmonics in your head, whatever. It's the way everything vibrates. And this is particularly an important way to understand, of course, musical sound. Pythagoras figured out, or part of his way of referencing this principle of harmonics was through music. And the musical intervals that he based this on were the most fundamental, extremely powerful, uh, and simplest relationships. And this was the octave, the perfect fifth, the perfect fourth, and the whole tone. And these are, were expressed in terms of ratios. So harmonics, from a Pythagorean point of view, harmonics is all the different ways something vibrates. Now Pythagoras, as you see, had, he, had a, he had a keen understanding that all that is, all that is, is interconnected. And all that is vibrates. And the, an expression of what this means is the harmonics of something. Now harmonics, like this little illustration shows, this is, this is just the harmonics coming off of a, off of a small disc that's been activated with a, with a, a certain pitch. And then this is all the different ways this, this disc is vibrating at that particular instant. And it changes uh, uh, with, each, with each change of frequency. But that's just a, an illustration of how complicated harmonics can be. But what Pythagoras wanted to do is he wanted to put, put this in a simpler term so that we could better understand it and then extrapolate from that. So what he used, he used the harmonics even though it's all the different ways something vibrates, he used how a string vibrates as a simpler way to illustrate harmonics. And even this is a simplification of how a string would vibrate. So he stretched a string, he divided that string in half, and he saw, and, he, and, he, and you can hear a discrete pitch. He divided that string into thirds, could hear a discrete pitch, into fourths, and so forth. All these fundamental ratios, one to one, one to two, one to three, one to four. Okay, so this served as the basis for musical scales and tuning. But more importantly, since everything is vibration, he saw the importance of music as a means to, as I said before, understand and connect with all that is. So that being said, of those pitches, of, of these relationships, you can see the, the, the first one is, is the fundamental, is just the basic, basic tone. The second one is the octave, 
Okay, that's the, 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 the first harmonic. Now the octave is a ratio of one to two. And what that means is it's always going to produce the same sound. It's the same, they call it a pitch class. When you look on a piano and you see all the C's, for instance, you, no matter which one you hit, it's all the same, they're all C's. Pitches, octaves apart, are musically equivalent to each other. And that keyboard you see there, those are all C's. You have a low C that's 564 hertz, a, 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 a low, another one at 128, middle C is the vibrating 256, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all multiples of two, and they're all C's. So that's called an octave equivalent. So the octave, how far can you go with an octave? If these are all equivalent, they're all essentially the same note, uh, you can go well beyond hearing. If you go enough octaves up from a specific pitch, you get into the equivalent color in that light in the light spectrum and if you go enough octaves down from light you get the equivalent musical pitch to that color so measuring the pitch of music and the color of light i find this really interesting this relationship we measure pitch in music by using time how many times does something vibrate in a second and that's called frequency we measure light by using space. We measure the length of a light wave in angstroms, and that's called a wavelength. Now these can be interrelated to each other. To tune to light, we take our cue from Pythagoras. We, we don't assign too much significance to apparently auspicious numbers. Now this is like part of what I'm coming from here in this in this understanding of, 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 of Pythagoras' broad view of the universe and also of this understanding of how, how to tune a musical instrument. You may have seen <clears throat> on, 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 uh, uh, online lots of references to uh, what they call the solfege uh, pitches, right? Like 432, 256 hertz, all these kind of things. And, and they attribute a lot of significance to these particular vibrations um, uh, because, of, um, because of their numerological significance or some metaphysical uh, um, significance and so forth. And um, but what they lose sight of is what they're, what, what, what one is, when, what you, when, you, when you do that, what you're doing is you're assigning a, a value or a significance based on the number rather than the sound. So what ends up happening is you end up creating all these musical sounds based on vibrations per second, a hertz. What the heck is a vibration per second? I mean, all, all a second is, is an arbitrary unit of measure. It's, it's something that we've made up in order to interpret the universe around us. It's not the universe around us. It's a model for the universe around us, okay, and in us. It's not it. It's just a way of measuring it. So instead of employing, uh, so, so when, this, when this happens, when you assign too much significance to a, some auspicious number, which is just based on an arbitrary unit of measure, that is not a Pythagorean way of looking at things. What he did is he employed the principle of relationships of things to each other. Okay, that uses numbers like one to two, two to three, uh, you know, 81 to 80, whatever, but they're all ratios. It has to do with the relationship of things. There's no intrinsic significance to the number itself. The significance is to the relationship of these things. So rather than um, what, we're, what I'm proposing and what I've been experimenting with is tuning to an existing significant phenomenon, a, a, a phenomenon of nature, in this case, light, which is extremely discreet, instead of a local unit of measurement, i.e. the second, which is just something made up. So if we use the principles of harmonics, and particularly the, the equivalence of octaves, and we use the principles of harmonic relationship to musically connect with all that is.
So this is the formula that's used. We're not going to dwell on this too much, but it's basically it's convert. It's, it's using the speed of light, frequency, and wavelength, and you can go either way with this. To get the color of light from a musical pitch, we divide the speed of light by the frequency, or to get the musical pitch from a color of light, we divide the speed of light by the wavelength. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. And what's interesting is light is only 40 octaves. It's only 40 octaves above, so above music, above sound, which means, of course, that sound is only 40 octaves down from light. So what that means is that we can take a discrete color, you know, of the seven colors of the rainbow, and we can do an octave equivalent from that and find out what it sounds like. So that's so I made this little chart here, and uh, if anybody wants a copy of it, I have a, GP, a JPEG of it, and 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 you guys can get it. Um, this shows um, <clears throat> this shows what happens when you when you convert those the colors, okay, into the discrete sound. So uh, it's it's worth looking at this just for a minute, so you can kind of put in perspective the different kind of music that this and that that this creates um, these are all octaves this these columns here are all the octaves right the 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 the, the bigger number is a higher octave because it's vibrating faster the lowest number is a lower octave it's vibrating slower this right here with the underline that is what would be what would be the closest to middle c on the piano and all the tuning systems that we use today. If you look over here in this last column, this is sense. Sense is a division of the octave. And it's a means by which to understand how so-called out of tune something is. When you're tuning a piano or tuning a synthesizer or guitar, whatever, it's all being tuned to equal temperament. And how much out of tune something is, whether it's too sharp or too flat, is determined in, the, in terms of sense. So I have here sense from an equal temperament. So middle C, or, the, or, the, or should, should we say the C of green, is actually 26 cents sharp from what we hear on a piano. It doesn't exist on a piano. And if you were to play those two notes together, they, would, they wouldn't sound good together. And, and you can see with other notes, for, for, particularly like, for instance, A, which is very significant, that's 36 cents flat from what's on, on equal temperament. But what's interesting to note with A is it's very close to 432. So in fact, for all practical purposes, it might as well be 432. So and A is orange. So with that in mind, taking from this chart, okay, we can, we can relate it to the chakras. In other words, we can say, okay, if we are subjecting ourselves or, or or listening to or being surrounded by a certain frequency such as this particular C, this is, this is activating the heart center. This is strengthening, activating gen and, uh, the heart center. And, and like I mentioned in, our last, in the last talk uh, about John aiming the tambura at his student's heart while his eyes were closed and not realizing that that was happening and his student's heart began to uh, vibrate and oscillate so strong that he couldn't keep his eyes closed anymore. Uh, that's because it was tuned to green. And, um, and then down below here, I have different tunings for the tempura, you know, for, for uh, uh, activating different, um, different aspects of the chakras. And now, the, this chart here, um, if you look at this for a minute, and then you'll remember that, you've got to memorize this. This is your homework. Uh, no, I'm kidding. The, but this is an illustration of the tuning that I have on the hand pan uh, that we'll be playing today. And the, that green in the middle, that's, that's the C. And uh, all these tunings around it are, are the different frequencies. And you can, you can tell from going, you know, you can kind of go back and forth between this one and the, and the chakra one to kind of see what's what, but you, you, you know how the, how the, the spectrum goes. So, and these are some these are just the notes and the references of, of where I where the formulas came from and where I got my hand pan and, and so forth. Um.
So, so can I ask you that. just a question before you carry on? Hmm? What, I, what I'd like to ask you just is, I have read that in the future, all healing will be done through sound. All what will be done through sound? All healing in the, in the future oh. will be done through sound. That makes sense. Right. What do you, what do you think on that? The thing to remember about sound, right? Um, and this is something that, that, that the Tambura teaches us, okay? And that this exercise in Pythagorean uh, tuning also teaches us, all right? That there's, there's heard and unheard sound. So uh, healing is brought about through sound but it can be brought about through also through sounds that we don't necessarily hear with our ears. Um, and so, uh, you know, that being said, I think broadly speaking, yeah, indeed, it can be, uh, healing can be brought, is, can be brought about and is brought about through sound. And what's important there, of course, is the discrete vibrations that are being used in that process. Does that make sense, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. It, it kind of makes me feel like in, in hospitals, they should be just be playing this incredible music to the patients while they're sitting in hospital, you know, just yeah. that type of thing. Instead of watching TV, they should just be playing this incredible music and saying, okay, well, you've got a problem. You've just had an operation on a trauma in your head. Let's play the, vi the violet indigo and the chord that goes with that is an E. And, you know, wow. Yeah. It's just, the limitless opportunities and possibilities with what you are presenting to us. Thank you. Absolutely. So, um, sorry, can I just jump in Scott very quickly? Um, huh? thank you. Thank you for that. I was just, I was just typing a question. Um, is it the sound that does the healing or the vibration? I used to use singing bowls on my clients, put them physically on the body. And it was the vibration that I felt made the difference. I don't know whether it was the sound or the vibration, but I felt because they said they can feel the vibration going down through the body. So I'm curious from your perspective, do you think it's the sound or the vibration of the sound that causes the healing? Oh, okay. Um, and oh, um, it's interesting that you're using two different terms there, the, so uh, the sound and the vibration of the sound. Uh, musically speaking, what we call that is timbre. The, the sound is the is the character of the sound. So uh, like my my voice, I could sing the green and anyone would be able to tell the difference between my voice and and the handpan. That's the timbre and what you're calling the sound, I'm assuming. Okay. okay. So indeed the timbre is important, especially like with, especially particularly with the singing bowls, right? Now, when I'm talking about the significance of the unheard sound, all right, that is essentially what I'm talking about there is the harmonics. Now, what's interesting is that the reason one thing has one timbre, such as the handpan or the tambura or a trumpet, the reason they have, and our voices, uh, the reason we have a different timbre is because of the harmonics. And therefore, there are certain things such as singing bowls, the tambura, the handpan, uh, gongs, um, those type of things. Because of their particular timbre, they have unique and very powerful harmonics. And so it's both the, it's both the pitch that something is tuned to, the fundamental pitch such as illustrated with the Pythagorean uh, octave equivalents, like green, uh, that is important. Uh, and but also the timbre is very important, because that's going to have the power of the harmonics. Yeah, you're welcome. So that being said, maybe we'll make some music. What do you think? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I think what you've been doing is making music anyway, but um, this is this will yeah. be a further treat. <laughs> so, um, Laura will be playing the tambura uh, for this operation. Um, and she's, um, like I say, she's been studying the, the music meditation for some time and is um, 
she's actually building a tambura uh, out in the shop uh, herself. So if you could scoot up maybe a little closer to the mic so that... Uh, I think so. Yeah. So. Okay, just a, just a warning to any of those who are driving your cars, listen to the podcast, just pull over to the yeah. side of the road because you might just... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good point. Okay. Scott comes with a warning. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me know if the temper is a little farther away from the mic than it was last time. So Laura's going to play a little bit and you can let me know if it's coming through all right. So just to reiterate, if you remember how that picture was of the, the colors on the hand pan, that was showing all of these different aspects of it. And this is the center note. That's the green, right? And then these are all the notes, other notes all around, all the other colors around. So all right. Let's just play for a little bit and, um, and let's hear how um, a pentatonic scale in green sounds. And in this particular one, I'll be using a bit of indigo. And with this, that's activating this area too. Okay, so, okay, go ahead. Thank you. 
Okay, wow. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Laura. Sure. Um, You're welcome, Michael. I feel like I've been tuned. That's what I feel like. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good point. You have been. Just feel like my chakras have been retuned. It's just so wonderful. So, what I would love to hear is from everyone else on the call what they experienced uh, during that. So, please just unmute yourself and share. I'd love you to share. Thank you. Summed it up beautifully there, Michael. Um, I feel like I'm, I was being tuned. Um, just everything, just I feel everything just sort of realigning um, on an energetic level. Um, so it just felt beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a uh, thank you, Lisa. Anyone else like to share? Uh, Yes, uh, certainly. Thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Scott and Laura. This was uh, truly out of this world experience. <laughs> <laughs> it, it took me um, <clears throat> somewhere there in the space. And um, wow, um, remember the first time when I heard you, you're playing tambura, I said that it was like a uh, like a pool into the tunnel of light and the doors were opening up. This time it was just catapulted without even going through the doors, I think, <laughs> because it was, uh, 
is such a powerful combination of sound and uh, yes so it, it, my body is still vibrating every cell is vibrating and outside and inside it's just so powerful thank you so much for this experience Welcome. amazing Welcome. thank you both of you thank you laura thank you thank you very much mm -hmm. yeah yeah, when I first, <clears throat> sorry, uh, thank you, Scott, and thanks, Michael, for hosting. Um, yeah, when I first started, I actually was really irritated, like not in, not in the, that the music wasn't suitable, but I could tell that there was something in me that wasn't um, happy that things were going to shift. <laughs> um, <laughs> Interesting. You know what I mean? It was like uh, that kind of a feeling. Um, and so then it was, I felt a lot in my lower um, chakras actually, like a lot of movement there, which felt really nice and really lovely. And then um, what's interesting is my daughter came in as the music was starting. Um, she was just sort of like, you know those snakes? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, it was really, really nice. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that it wasn't me, Laura, that you were talking about was going to support you when you're playing the music. When Michael first said that, I was like, no, no, no I don't do music. I just... Yeah. <laughs> Laura, yes, shared in the, uh, Laura shared in the last podcast that she's going to buy a hang pen, so that's why she was yeah. referring to that, yeah. <laughs> Um, what's interesting is there's um, acupuncturists who use sound instead of needles when they're treating. They use the tuning forks, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, so it's interesting how from all of these different perspectives, there's so many threads that are common, you know? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for sharing your, your, your wonderful insights and your presence and awareness of what was actually going on with you in your lower chakra. That's amazing. So. Yeah, that um, what's interesting on this tuning, and, and you might remember from the from that chart, is that the um, uh, that the A, right, that A is uh, is orange, right? It's it's and um, uh, and there's also you know I mean the, the the lower notes on here, not the lower pitches, but the lower aspects of the scale, are made definitely definitely low low chakra activators and that's why it's in i feel that's what one of the reasons why it's important to have this c in the center right to have this green in the center to to constantly kind of bring it back bring it back into into some balance right because that's where it is the, the the green is in the middle right and and you can begin to activate the kundalini or you can activate the lower chakras or or start the upper but constantly are always coming back to the to the to the center of that yeah so thank you scott for that the the words that came up for me was um the magic of music and the music of magic <laughs> that's just what i felt i think that's just a, a beautiful it kind of does both really when, when i feel into it now in universal law, the first law is the law of harmony. Ah, oh, interesting. The first law, harmony. Right. Everything is in balance. Everything is in harmony, even if it is into different paradigms, different realities, different frequencies. There's a harmony at, at the, the core center of that. So, but then um, something else that came up for me, Stu uh, Scott, is that I wore my business shirt for you today because there is going to be some business to be done today. <laughs> And the business is when are you hosting your next Darshan and <laughs> how can we reach out to you for your meditations, you and Laura, or, you know, how can we do this and how, how can we reach out to you? Are you available to do these types of things, to do your meditations perhaps? Uh, is this something that you're working on? You know, that's, that's kind of tricky in a way because it's, it's, it's very corporeal. I mean, it's very body oriented. It's not something that really, uh, uh, translates well um, uh, in the uh, digital world. Um, if, someone, if someone has a, uh, a tambura, a, a, a good tambura, and, you know, can, and, and knows how to properly play it and produce the right kinds of sounds, um, then they can learn this technique of, uh, of playing and listening. Um, 
I'm doing a workshop with a man in, in Los Angeles along those lines. He, he has a, a, a he commissioned a tambura from me and, 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 and has become quite fascinated with the tambura meditation aspect of it, right? And it doesn't have to be just a tambura. I mean, it can be any, any kind of instrument which creates a, a, a rich and powerful ambient sound. I, I would say there's probably only two that qualify in, in my mind, and that's either the, the tambura or the uh, Tibetan bowls. Uh, and those can e could either be uh, the bronze and brass ones or, or the crystal ones. Uh, and of course a hand pan. But if one is using that technique with a hand pan or they, they would treat it more like a gong and not, not so much as a, as a melodic instrument. So to answer your question, yeah, it's not really an online kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes perfect yeah. sense that, yeah. Okay, Scott, thank you so but much. I'm free to, I'm, I'm happy to share the kind of the insights of it or whatever, you know, yeah. the principle of it. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Just once again, thank you so much to you for being on the podcast and thank you to you for you, Very Laura. Uh, we have a question just before you go. I think that's from, huh? from Anna. Yes, I, I was just wondering, uh, since you mentioned Tibetan Ball, and I was thinking, Scott, that uh, how would that be all together the tree of when you combine those two instruments with the Tibetan Ball, the brass Tibetan Ball, and the one that I brought from India, I think would be the sound would be so amazing to try to play together and see how that will come out. Wow, I would be so interested. We have to try this. Yeah, yeah. The the thing about yeah. the Tibetan bowls is, of course, um, I mean, it depends on how old they are, right? The older, mm -hmm. ones, obviously. It's all the older ones. The newer ones, they tune them. them, you know. And, uh, yeah. Um, that messes them up. Now, no, uh, this is very old one. Yeah. So that's and it's really interesting yeah. to to see what the pitches are on those. Obviously, yeah, it, would, it would just be. It would just be luck one way or another if it happened to be in tune with the hand pan, right? Because I know. But uh, it's easy enough to tune the tambura. I've I've played. Uh, uh, my brother has a couple of really old Tibetan bowls, like 400, 500 years old, and and he. Uh, when I went to visit him, we played the tambura with the Tibetan bowls, and it's a lovely, lovely sound. It's it's very similar to doing with the hand pan, only it's more more mesmerizing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. We have to try it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Anna. Take off your Tibetan bowls. <laughs> uh, soon we're going to have a whole orchestra. That's where it's going. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds really, really good. The Point Roberts Orchestra. <laughs> Thank you for all of you for listening in. This has been wonderful to, to have you here. And thank you, Scott, once again and to you and to Laura and for everyone for listening. You're welcome, Michael. Now you set yourself free from anxiety this week for everyone. God bless you. <laughs> all righty.